We have a caller on the line. Hi. I want to say to you, like, I'm Jamaican Indian. My mother is Jamaican Jew and Chinese. Yeah. So I would say to you, what am I? And, and, and that's a very good question, and that's a question that I can I, I see answer. And I see myself as right. being black. reason why, I take the identity of my father. And you're saying, what is black Canadian culture? There's no such thing as Canadian culture. Eating spaghetti and french fries are putu, that's not a culture. And the point that I'm making, though, is that there is a Canadian culture. There must be a Wait, Canadian culture how because... Can, how can you say that there's a Canadian culture when 95% of the teachers in Canada are white teaching your kid who is black? I'm, I'm not sure are I you black? the question. Are you black? Am I black? Yeah. What, what do you think? Do I sound black? Well, you, you're British, I agree, but, but, but you, 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 to me, you're more like a mixed person, I'm a, mixed a person, person of color, a mixed person not color. white, but yeah. maybe you're mixed. I'm, I'm as black, I'm, uh, it's visually, I'm, probably, I'm black, very dark. Well, maybe mentally you're not. From a young age, I've tried to understand why race is the primary thing that defines me. I accept my blackness. But the tighter I hold on to it, the more elusive it becomes. The question is, if race plays such a significant role, what part do I play in creating my own identity? My name is Sobaz Benjamin. I was born in London, England 37 years ago. My parents are from Grenada. I now live in Canada with my wife, Lillian Lopi, my son, Khalil, who is six, and my three-year-old daughter, Taya. The happiest moment of my life, thus far, is, it has been the birth of my children. Um, and that has been brought to me through my wife. When I was born in hospital, she visited my mother and I, and she, you know, she took a look at me in the crib. She took a look at my mom and said, "You know, are you sure he's your son? He's so he's so black." Because I was darker than my mom and darker than my dad. And um, my mom told me that story in a joking way, and um, I used to laugh too. Uh, but then, when you know, it's those incremental things that build up that sort of make you realize at some point. Everybody's kind of, not necessarily everybody, but it feels like everybody is focusing on your skin. In my experience, blackness is an identity that has emerged largely out of reactionary circumstances. The struggle to turn blackness into something beautiful was so essential that I think we have forgotten that we were fighting for our humanity, for the right to be human, not the right to be black. In order to experience more of yourself, you have to identify the things that may be in the way of that experience. And I think race is one of those things. I met Tim Dunn in Halifax when he was performing in a community cultural show. After the event, I felt compelled to talk to him. 
I was baptized here in this big room at the front of the church. I discovered that Tim was raised in Toronto during the 1940s by a black family. I used to recite the books of the Bible. They used to stand me up and have me recite them because I could do that. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Where does one race begin and the other one end? Camille Turner is an artist who lives in Toronto. Her family, like mine, is from the Caribbean. She was born in Jamaica and moved to Canada when she was nine. Camille's art is expressed through various disciplines, but it is her performance art that resonates most with me. And I think that that is kind of a strength in a way, because I think when I, when I create work, I'm drawing from all kinds of different places. Um, you have more control than you think over who you actually are, and you can deconstruct some of it if you like. Diane Rutherford that, was that born and raised work. in England like I was. She has her master's in sociology and lectured in Birmingham before coming to Canada. Issues of identity are very important for both of us and our children. It might be sad to say, but in some contexts, the, to, to keep knocking on racism might be easier. When I was about 14, that's when I started using skin bleaching creams. My mother used to look after children in their home. And um, one of the children my mom used to look after was a little black girl. Her name was Dion. So, yeah, I grew up with Dion as a sister. Um, we went to the same primary school. We went to the same secondary school. Dion was also the person who advised me to, to use the skin bleaching cream. She said, why don't, why don't you use this stuff? And she said, you know, me and my mum use it. Why don't you use it? You know, and, and I did. I don't think my parents were aware of the fact that I was using skin bleaching creams. Having said that, my mother gave me space. That was one of the things I'm eternally grateful for. And um, she might have known that I was using skin bleaching creams, but if she did, she never shared that with me. My father never, well, I don't know, he died, right, before we had any type of conversation along those lines. Uh, which is sort of why I think, it, why, you know, I sort of look for the answers, maybe to the detriment within myself, because um, you find answers with, with other people. Keep it up. What kind of noise you want it to make? Is this good enough? Is this the kind of noise you want? Yeah, it is. All right. Modeling with Tim was very risky for both of us. I'd never modeled before. He's afraid of aging so publicly. I think he somehow projects onto me his desire to be black. And for me, just taking my clothes off and being naked and being aware of the, you know, the black body, black male body is not one that um, is free of, of uh, of significance and free of meaning. There's a lot of stereotypes that are pinned onto that. Turn around, like 90 degrees. You go this way, you go that way. It's obvious, but... Uh... I started modeling in Toronto about 19 years ago. Well, 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 I need to be held up at my age. Modeling is the one activity that has right? really allowed me to believe that I indeed am a legend in my own mind. You know, I generally, I'm a very, very cynical and, and skeptical person about most things. I don't, belief is not something that I, that I warm to, especially belief in myself. But modeling, I just, I, I transform. Sobaz knew that years before I'd modeled with Camille and was intrigued. 
I think we both felt that by modeling together, we'd each shed our skin. I just felt invulnerable because I had separated myself totally from the people around me. There was no longer any need to suffer the torture of trying to communicate with people. It was entirely one way. Yes, I know, your vulnerability is your shield. This is the thing about when you're isolated, spending too much time in your head and not being able to communicate with other people. The voice is your own and you try to make sense of things by yourself. And when you don't have the input from others, very often you miss pieces. You have to go out there and connect with other people because they have other people have pieces of your puzzle. That's a lot better. Yeah, but but then I can't Keep it to close. say that I have always wanted to be That's okay. black sounds patently ridiculous to me. But in terms of my feelings, it's not ridiculous at all. You know, talking about it puts me in mind of an anecdotal story from my childhood. Supposedly, I came home from school one day in tears and told the family that somebody in school had told me that I wasn't black. And Ruth, apparently, and Ruth was there. Doris says that Ruth said, "Yeah, but we. <laughs> it's okay, Tim. We love you anyway." They were and still are, you know, my family. The Baileys. They've always been my family. Grandma, Grandpa, Aunt Ruth, Aunt Doris. I've always totally unselfconsciously addressed everybody in the family in, in that way. You know, and often people do a double take, say, huh? <laughs> Grandpa? <laughs> Grandpa's black? Oh, come on, no. So there's never been any doubt on my part. I can shrug off wannabe, but Wigga still shakes me up. Maybe because it sounds true in my head. I can admit to the fact that Whiteness was something that I aspired to. I can admit to that openly. It was, you know, everything that was good, that was ideal. It's, it's anything worthwhile pursuing is presented to you, whether explicitly or implicitly, in Western culture, in white terms. That's it. I think we did very well. Race is important to me. Being around people who look like me feeling that I don't have to explain myself to them, feeling that there's a shared sense of experience, a, there's a bond. Those things are important things, but you can develop that with people who do not look like you, who don't have the same educational background, class background, religious background. That's that possibility. And to me, race is something that can operate to close down those possibilities of connecting with other people. In 1999, Camille Turner crowned herself Miss Canadiana, a performance piece she created to challenge assumptions about what it means to be black and Canadian. She has been invited to present Miss Canadiana at events across the country and around the world. On this occasion, Camille has brought Miss Canadiana to North Preston, just outside of Halifax, Nova Scotia. North Preston was first settled in 1784 by black loyalists, former slaves who fought for Britain during the American Revolution. Hey, how are you? Hello. Hi. 
So where do you all live? Right here. Right here. Oh, you live down there. <laughs> it's really nice meeting everybody. Yeah. I live in Toronto. Toronto. <gasps> How did you know? I went camping one time in North Bay, Ontario, which is a, a small town. It's about four hours north of Toronto. And uh, I was walking through this mall because we we're just buying some supplies for camping and people were just staring at me. They were just staring at me like, whoa, you know, who are you? And I felt like really strange, you know. I wasn't dressed funny, I wasn't doing anything weird. I was just like everybody else, but people were just looking at me like I was a foreigner. And I thought, you know, wow, how long do I have to live in this country before I feel Canadian, before I feel welcome here? So I decided at that moment that I was going to become a symbol of everything that is Canadian. The reason for that is this is supposed to be a multicultural country, right? where everybody belongs, doesn't matter what color you are, where you come from, but I didn't feel that way and people weren't treating me that way. So I decided that I was going to become the symbol of everything that was Canadian. And I was going to challenge their ideas of what beauty is and what, um, and what a Canadian looks like. So I just went out there and I was thinking, okay, this is going to be interesting. But to my surprise, people responded so positively. I've been to all kinds of different countries. I've been to Germany, Senegal, uh, Mexico. I've been all over Canada to different places. And I think it's really important for people to see that there are all kinds of different people that make up this country in all kinds of different colors. It's brought me into all kinds of places to speak about these things that I would never have normally been able to go to and to speak about these kind of issues. I say three, okay? Okay. okay. One, two, three. Yay! Yay. <laughs> There is love with race, um, and yes, the negativity also is there. I can talk about the slavery and race as this thing that was created to justify the oppression of black people, but it doesn't really provide an understanding for me that nourishes me, that makes me feel that I understand. Welcome to CKDU 97.5 on your FM dial. My name is Sobaz Benjamin, and uh, sitting right beside me is my co-host, Diane Rutherford. And if you want to call in and contribute, uh, by all means... I love community so, radio uh, because sort of to like truly connect with an audience, we have to communicate we'll see, and rely more on the internal parts of ourselves. I agree with that because we had... Diane and I have many things in common, but enough differences to keep our conversations lively. So, okay, so if you're not black, who are you? And that's partly what I'm... Although Diane was born in England, she never felt at home there, and race has a lot to do with those feelings of not belonging. It is hard. It would be quite a revolution if we did, though. You think about it, though. Well... You know, if en masse, yeah, all the dark people (laughs) decided, okay... I'm going to throw off the oppression of how society has conceived me as a black person, how society has defined me purely by my skin. And I'm going to be who I want to be, somebody different. And if collectively people did that, that would challenge the social construction of race. The day you decide, okay, I'm going to... I always wanted to leave England. Myself. Mainly because I had always had the understanding that we were unwanted. I remember coming home from school and asking my mom when we were going to be sent back to the Caribbean because there was still a politician that talked about repatriation of um, immigrants, or particularly people from the West Indies. 
Yeah, so maybe at a point when we were encouraged to emigrate, we were wanted, but that we were no longer wanted. And that I saw so that I would get out when I had the opportunity to. So I was planned to do that, but I didn't know where I was going to go. Diane, her husband Andy and their three children immigrated to Canada five years ago. From all they had researched, Canada sounded like a place they would finally call home. I had decided that if I moved somewhere, I would not live somewhere that wasn't multiracial. And I always wanted to live by the sea. So Halifax had this like oldest black community in North America and the sea. And so we thought, okay, why don't we try that? When you look up Canada, it's like, we need immigrants, we need these kinds of skills. And we had our application accepted within six months. So that gave you the impression that it was kind of, you know, all go, go, you can, there's gonna be no particular difficulty in getting employment and that kind of thing. <laughs> so yeah, we came for the adventure and we wanted to be, I don't know, I almost wanna say I, I wanted to come somewhere that race didn't count, but I don't really mean that because I don't want to be uh, without race, yeah? But um, I wanted, I just thought there would be more opportunities without me having to explain or prove myself in the same way all the time, that, in the way that I felt we had to in Britain. I left England when I was um, 15 moved to the Caribbean with my mother. Moving to Grenada was really interesting because my mum, all of a sudden, out of nowhere it seemed to me, one day, I just heard my mum saying, you know, I'm tired of being in England. 26 years of, of living in this place that is not my home. So we, we moved to Grenada. We moved a month after the Grenadian intervention or invasion, depending on what side of the political fence you're for. My father, um, he remained in England to sell our house while well, we set up another house in Grenada. And he died a month after we arrived there. So, um, that was hard, yeah. My parents, my biological parents, put me in an institution in Toronto called the Mother Craft. And they met a black woman who worked there as a nurse's aide, Ruth Bailey, as it turned out. And she was, I think, uh, so my primary caregiver there. Um, and I guess they told her that they they were looking for another situation for me. I guess she told my parents that her mother looked after kids. And so I just became part of the family. And I was there until I was 12 years old. I can't remember a thing, but the day I was taken away, it changed my life. I quit school at 14. I ran around the streets. That wouldn't have happened if I'd stayed with the Baileys. The only rationale I can arrive at for why my parents took me back was that it was for their, it was, it was for their benefit. Uh, I think more than mine. I, I mean, I don't know what the fuck they were thinking, because except that they thought, perhaps that that having me there um, would help repair their lives and their relationship. I don't know. Anyway, my dad was a terminal alcoholic, and then when I was 15, he uh, he disappeared for for a couple of weeks and the next thing we heard was that he was he was dead. In my mid-twenties I got into university. I felt I'd finally done something to make the Baileys proud of me. 
but I was still insecure about their love. For a while, I was reluctant to um, to tell the family about being an artist model, um, and not to mention some other aspects of my life too, because I, I, the back of my mind, I thought they would disapprove. What does that mean? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you know, a black man taking his clothes off is different from a white man taking his clothes off. Is that plain and simple? I don't know. I don't well, you know. know. And I modeled in, you know, in San Francisco, in Oakland, and in Berkeley. I mean, well, you know, uh, almost no black models. It would seem it is different. A black What's man an Oreo? Off, a white man taking his clothes off. Is the black the man who was sold out? You've yeah. betrayed your race. Certainly. You, you might be black, but. You know, you're white on the inside. If you are, as people may accuse you of being an Oreo, it means you're ashamed of who you are and ashamed of your community and ashamed of where you come from. And I'm not, not in the least. Hey. Give me a hug and a kiss. Come give daddy hugs and kisses. Hey, you're in the way. You know what I want you to do? Come here. Jump off, jump off the thing. This? Yeah. yeah. Like doing tricks? Yeah, like doing tricks. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, oh good one. Did that hurt? Yeah. No. Yeah. Hey, what's our favorite song? No. Yeah, let's do it. What happened in Grenada? Um, contrary to what a lot of white people may think, black people do tan too. So I tan deeply. And I became very, I mean, very dark, even darker than I am right now. Tell you. I like to move and move it. I like to move and move it. <laughs> I remember walking into a classroom once and one of the students said, you know, boy, it gets blacker every day, she said. You come from England, aren't you so dark? And I said, yeah, I got to get some skin bleaching cream again here. And I started using it from about 16. When I was there till about, till I left, which was about uh, in my 20s. And it never really worked. I mean, I just have blotches, is what would happen to me, blotches of light skin. It was more urgent for me to use that in Grenada because I needed to be different. Because difference, especially when you, know, when you come from away, there was currency there, it meant something. Maybe it's about, you know, I'm so obsessed with race because how can you not be? It's the air you breathe, in a way. You step outside of your house and, um, you know, you get on the bus to go to work or to go to school or to go play, have fun, do something, you know, leisure time or you're going to visit somebody and for me, something always happens unless I choose not to look at it or unless I choose not to see it. But something always happens that reminds me of the fact that I'm black. So boys and girls, I'm gonna ask if you can go back to your desks when I say go and draw us on a piece of paper. Just one of you? No. Both of us. That's gonna be hard. We try your best. And you know what? I haven't said to my children that they are black children. The reason I think I haven't said that is because of my experience of my own blackness. All right. Is that? You think you can handle that? Yeah. Okay. So I ask you to quietly tiptoe back to your desk. Tiptoe. Differences. Yeah. I mean, and that's what's, yeah. that's to me what's, what's important. How they interpret the differences. Blackness is something that can change. Blackness does change. I know that because, you know, we've been moved from Negroes to color to people of color and black and then we're African, whatever, you know, African American, African Canadians. So those terms shift. Maybe it is all about change. You know, but part of me knows that there is something within me, and 
that is constant, that is unchanging, is that something that I pull on during difficult times, challenging times, hopeless times. That thing that is there is something I can remember pulling on when I was my daughter's age, when I was my son's age. Telling my children that they are black children, I mean, I, it's, it's, uh, it's not enough. It's not enough. Whenever they've talked about colour, we've made sure that they know that black isn't just the colour black, that there's a concept there too, and that you refer to people in that way, even though they may have all different shades of brown. These are people with brown skin who are black. And I don't want them to have an event or an experience in the future where they're going to have to confront being black for the first time and have it be a shock. And also have it be something that they actually perceive to be negative. You washed my hair? And I would kind of feel that if I kept that information back from them, then I'm actually endorsing that something's wrong with being black. And there isn't. Give me something else. If you love who you see, it doesn't matter what anybody says to you. You have your self-esteem and you can, you can meet any kind of conflict. And no one can damage, you know, the essence of who you are. And if they don't get that early, then they're at the mercy of other people's interpretation. And usually what people are going to do when you, when you go to school and such is they're going to throw black at you like it's something that you should be ashamed of. And if they already know who they are from the beginning, then that's a battle they don't have to fight with people. My parents always said, walk like you're kicking the world. Well, you know, you've got to be better than them. <laughs> you've got to, you know, like this, these are the things that they gave me. There was always this, this feeling of steal yourself, you know. And inside our home, it was safe. But as soon as you step out the door, it's not safe anymore. So here, here is your armor. Get out there and do battle. Look fantastic! Black Canadian does not exist. Doesn't exist. There is no concept of black Canadian in most people's minds. You know, for me, the sense of belonging is, uh, is so important. I feel like that search for home has been this thing that mm, I've been really kind of obsessed with or, um, it's what kind of drives me in, in, in my art making. I don't know if I ever really had that sense of home. You know, I'm not sure. Because home for me was the place that my family would be reunited in, or united for the first time, really, because my father was always somewhere else. He was always in the Bahamas or in the States, and then finally here, and it, home was always going to be wherever he is, and he'd send for us, and then we'd be a family, and then we'd be home. So home was always somewhere else. It was never where I am now, you know? I was born in Jamaica, and my parents always referred to it as back home. So then we went back home, and nothing looked like I remembered it. And everything just either had changed or disappeared. People weren't the same. I wasn't the same. People thought of me as a stranger. And uh, the only thing I recognized was my granny's house, but it looked really small. I don't know if it's necessarily about pursuing a place, you know, on the map. For me, at this stage in my life at least, it's about finding that internally. 
and maybe I'm connecting with people who I hope I will have a sense of home with them. Toronto in the 1940s was not the multicultural city it has now become. Tim Dunn's family, the Baileys, were part of a small black population that lived near the Garment District in downtown Toronto. The street where Tim lived with the Baileys from age two until 12 hasn't changed nearly as much as he has. Although the Baileys were always there for Tim and he had a relationship with his biological mother throughout her life, he's never felt secure with the love he's received from them. This is home, this is home for me, still. 77 Sullivan Street, I could, I could walk in that front door blindfolded right now. Tim has been touched so strongly by blackness that he considers the Baileys to be his family and they treat him that way. That doesn't make him black, but he has formed a bond that is in many ways stronger than skin color. That was where, yeah. that was about the only time grandma let me go in the special room when, my parents, when, my, when my parents came. And uh, yeah, I, I only remember their coming because of, of the photographs of me with my parents. We wanted you as a child, and the, your parents even, to know that we weren't trying to change you over in any way to sort of keep you to us. We understood it was just for a certain length of time, and we wanted you to know that you're going to go home with your mom and dad on the weekend. In our mind, it was just temporary. Yeah, yeah. You, you must have wished, through, you know, it, it wasn't just such an arrangement. Oh, I see. You know, that, oh, oh, yes. You know, well, we, we used to say if they ever want to give him out for adoption, we would take him. I guess that's what I was trying Is to get Is that what you're trying to get I at? Oh, yeah, that I came up several times, so, but uh, I don't think they would have sanctioned it. That's what I meant, it. By, yeah. No, they uh, wouldn't sanction yeah. it at that time. No, yeah. that didn't come till later. But your mother felt, I wouldn't say intimidated, but I think she felt, now here's a new baby, she felt is our home ready for this child? And to protect the child, I don't want to bring him in the home. She knew enough, she knew, your mother knew, to bring him in the home and to have contention or dysfunction or whatever going on would not be best for her and the child. And, and the situation, quote unquote, really, it didn't get Hadn't better. Changed. It didn't get better. Exactly, and, you know, exactly. Yeah, so you have to be years. thankful she did remove you out of that situation yeah. early. Yeah. Regardless, yeah. but as far as her love went for you, it never diminished, and she tried her best to make it work. Yeah. Well, I think I okay, okay. You have I, to I, give her credit for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. A lot well, of credit. Well, all I can say is that it was it was, if that was you know how they cared for me, I don't care. I don't you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I I don't. Maybe I know, because you suffered, so to speak. But she was suffering, too. Your father is suffering. The three of you were suffering yeah. in your own way. But she was determined to keep you with her, whether with him or not with her. And she did. Maybe it still hurts you as you get older, but get over it. <laughs> <In a way>. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> Try to get okay, over it. Okay, Doris. All right. No, <laughs> That's yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. No, I do other things. Oh, all right. right. See, I got, I got, I got myself going there.
I said I wanted to run my own race. That's what I did. I didn't finish. Diane's search for home will end up where it began back in England, where her mother and family still live. Unlike many immigrants who initially come to Halifax, Diane will not travel deeper into Canada to seek a sense of home. I tell you why I wouldn't move to another place in Canada because Canada's blown it. I'm just looking to see what you guys. Because I don't feel that Canada's honest with its immigrants. And so that's why I would not subject my family to doing this whole new thing again somewhere else. To, I, I don't feel I owe that to Canada. You cannot present yourself as this humanitarian, out there, diverse persona that you do not live up to. So that's everything that you want. Black is a spectrum of behaviors a spectrum of values, a spectrum of lifestyles. And I criticize Britain for that, but it's, I think it's worse here, that people have a much more rigid idea of what it is to be black, including white people. So you're just as much struggling against the perception by black people that you are not behaving black enough as well as the perception by white people about what kind of a black person are you anyway? What are you going to put in there? So as an African Nova Scotian, you'd be locked in by people like you and then white people who are all expecting you to be whatever this black behaviour thing is when, you know, maybe that doesn't even exist. So uh, that has been one of the things with the children too that I've thought, well, from what I see of what it, this thing is that people think is black, I don't want them to be that. It's really limiting. And um, the longer they're here, the less likely they would be to make a different choice. Because of Miss Canadiana, I have a platform now to do something in the real world. She's not a joke anymore. She's not just this icon. So I can use the profile that she has to do things in the real world. And, and I, I guess I'm realizing that as I go along. It's not just for me. This means something to other people. And, and I think this piece really depends on the public and the media. I mean, she is created by other people as much as she's created by me. The more feedback and interaction she, she gets, the, the more she evolves, really. I mean, she's become a real entity. And also, I'm seeing the connections between her and me, and I, I'm learning as I go along. I mean, I think I can do this because it's my natural tendency to walk between worlds. You know, I don't live in any one world. I need Miss Canadiana because I feel like that image of blackness um, as part of Canadianness needs to be out there. And for me, I just wanted to, to disseminate this image that was really important to me. Um, I want to see myself represented in the mainstream, you know? I am here. This is my country, so this is, this is really important. When I went to York University in 1990, I met a young man named Frank, and he was as dark as I was. And I saw him interacting with people in a way that I wanted to really interact with people. People liked him and wanted to be around him. And 
was like, whoa, that's, that's, you know, he's doing that and he's as black as I am. So maybe I can do that too. Definitely after that point, and I probably was in my early 20s, I definitely did not go back to using skin bleaching creams like after, after that moment. People are afraid, you know? The black male body is like a really potent thing. There's a lot that people write on that body. A normalized body is a white body. So I think it's interesting that you chose the, the different masks as well. It's like, you know, you and Tim standing there, one's body is raced and one is not. People want to make things neutral. And in art classes, they go to great lengths to make things neutral. They talk about the body as the form, as if you don't exist, as if you're not a real person. They don't want you to be a real person, but you are. I think what you're doing is very similar to what Miss Canadiana is doing. You know, you're being a mirror um, for, for people looking at this. They're gonna be bringing all kinds of things to their perception of you. Yeah, I think it's about looking, but it's up to the individual because they have to examine their own response. It's the process of, of coming to it and really seeing yourself. To be accepted for who you are. Look at me. When people hear stuff like, you know, look at me, mm -hmm. what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, he's a guy, look at me. What's mm -hmm. so, you know, you're so special about you. Yeah, but you know, so Baz, I feel like all my life I have been looked at as a symbol of the opposite of beauty. You know, I've been told that I was ugly all my life. You know, I look in in magazines, I don't see myself. I look in the media, I don't see myself, you know? I think it's really important to feel beautiful, to see yourself reflected and know that you're beautiful. Like that is really, it's a pretty powerful and important thing, you know, to see people around you, to, to see yourself mirrored back. It's really important, yeah. And that's what I want to pass it to my children. Yes. Because yeah. getting it from yourself is hard. Yes, yeah, it is. Self-love, right? But it's hard not to, I'm trying to uh, um, allow myself to feel. Or, or to say what it, what, what it is, but it's, it's almost like, you know, it's, it's blank. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I kind of draw blanks and... and uh, Breathe so fast, breathe, breathe, <coughs> breathe. Be accepted for who you are. Like I said, it's gift, right? <laughs> gift. Yes. Totally. Gift. Gifts we give each other. Totally. Okay. Camille mirrors my experience and sees me for who I am. Is this what we're all so afraid of? 
to be seen for who I am is terrifying. And I suspect would be terrifying for anyone because we all wear masks, don't we? I want to ask you, what are things that are different in your drawings between Sobaz and I? What are the things that are different? So Sobaz has a cap. Sobaz has a cap. What else? Hello, what's some of the things that are different and same? First, glasses. Your dad has glasses and I don't wear glasses? Okay, what else? Harriet? Your skin. Skin. What's the difference? He has a brownish look in you. And I have more of a pinkish, probably a little more reddish today because I had too much sugar. And I know one thing that yeah. that's different. You're a principal and he's a dad. <laughs> and a As you see us, that's right. Yeah. Do you know what? Here's I'm going to ask you a really important question now. What things are the same about us? What things are the same? Yeah? We both have hair. Both have hair? Yeah. Both have eyes. Both have eyes. We're both people. We're both people. Uh -huh. What do you think? Why do you think so bad that I asked you to draw us today? Yeah. Because, because um, we like to draw. Yeah. There's so much more below the surface that is of, of value to share. I mean, that's what I look for in relationships with other people. You don't when I meet somebody, oh, you're a black person and. So, so I know everything about you? No. I have to spend time with you, get to know you, and slowly uncover who you are. Blackness is just a door in a way, you know? It just, it's just, it's just, it's, it's a way to, it's a way to enter into a person. But once you're inside, I mean, you have to explore. Progress means that I can take the leap into the unknown. Just as I stand on the shoulders of those who went before me, contemplating what they could not. My children will stand on my shoulders, elevated enough to see and experience the things that I can only dream of. to stay. 